Yeah, hello everybody. Once again, Thomas here. This is talk number five, security aspects of KNX, LoRaWAN, Z-Fave and similar protocols. So the title says us all. We um, have a basic look on or an we give an introduction about um, those basic security aspects. Um, the content is uh, KNX threatening scenarios and security analyzer. So this more or less concludes the last session when we talked about KNX as a protocol. Um, here, um, yeah, we, we use our knowledge about KNX, the, the structure of the network, the field bus uh, structure itself, to have a look or to, to yeah, come up with a threatening scenario. LoRaWAN Z-Wave um, are examples for IoT protocols. We have a look on security aspects. We have a look on encryption. We have a look on confidentiality, authentication and so on. Uh, those protocols are being used via radio, um, so they, they are wireless protocols and hence there's a higher need for security in, in those yeah, protocols. Objectives of the lecture, we look at some possible attacks and attack vectors with regard to some sample protocols, uh, sample protocols, KNX, uh, Z-Wave and the Raman. If you don't know those protocols, I will give an overview later about yeah, application domains and uh, basic concepts of those protocols. We learn something about the assessment of attacks and risks. We also look at uh, methodologies, yeah, how we can assess a risk, how we can assess the security of a network. First, we start with the security analysis of building automation systems. Uh, as I said, um, we conclude our session about KNX. Key requirements for uh, security are authentication. What does it mean? Um, the, the other part party is uh, authentic, means the other party is what it yeah, claims to be. In a network, um, it's not very easy to prove your own authenticity because um, yeah, you, you can provide, for instance, a password, a shared secret or something, but uh, if you do it in plain text, an attacker might eavesdrop this or might intercept, might tap this and then use the same password again. Authorization is a, another key requirement, which means um, that you grant access to certain resources. So an authorization might be you are authorized to enter a building, you are authorized to open a door, you are authorized to print something on a printer. Confidentiality, as the name suggests, means uh, we want to keep secret information confidential. We want to keep information within a desired group of recipients. So not everybody can read or can understand the message, only those people that are the intended audience can read the message. Availability is another key requirement. This means the system is available, the system works whenever we need it. So in building automation, availability is a key requirement, obviously, because uh, for instance, if the air condition failed or if the heating fails or if uh, let's say the lighting fails, we, we do have a problem. Another uh, thing we uh, or another term we should look at is attack vector. The attack vector describes a possible attack, a possible path of attack, and the attack technique that an unauthorized intruder, no matter of what kind, can use to compromise a foreign computer system. For instance, to penetrate it without authorization, and then either take it over, or at least abuse it for his own purposes. So, uh, for instance, if you put some lights on, uh, you don't take over the system, but um, you, you abuse the system. In most cases, known security holes in the attack system are used for this purpose. Such exploitation is called an exploit. Uh, strange explanation. So, um, an exploit is something that an attacker uses to get access to the system. The methodology we use here is uh, basically all risk assessment methodologies for network use the same principles, which are yeah, first capturing the network structure, network plan survey. Um, an attacker 
or even those people who are responsible to maintain security for a network, uh, those people yeah, need to know the structure of the network because they, they, they are looking for weaknesses, they are looking for yeah, ways to get physical access to the network. In order to do so, the network structure is something to look at. Capture of application or yeah, surveying all the applications that are within the network is also needed because uh, you want to know what traffic is to be expected in the network and uh, in order to do so you need to know what applications are running and um, what yeah, data creation process works in those applications. So this means you, you know what to expect. Connected devices or having a look at connected devices is also uh, a need in this methodology or in almost all methodologies because um, yeah, you, you have to know who is um, allowed to send a, a, a message and who's not, who is authorized to send a message. And uh, you also have to know uh, the devices because you want to authenticate those devices. There are also a lot of organizational aspects, who has access, how are accesses distributed and passed on, are accesses locked. So um, locking means you, you later on want to know who did something. Um, granting access to others is a problem. So for instance, there, there might be some person responsible, maybe an administrator to pass on access rights, but uh, the question is, can you trust the administrator? So if you assume, let's say, 1% of people are evil, uh, this also includes 1% of the admin administrators. Um, the determination of protection needs is another point. So we have a look on possible attacks, we have a look on possible damage, we determine the effort required for an attack and thus an estimation of the possible probability of occurrence. So in general, a risk is probability times possible damage or potential damage. Um, yeah, you could, you could imagine, for instance, an, an asteroid uh, crashing into let's say, your hometown, the probability is very low, but the damage would be devastating. So um, the overall risk is yeah, still very low. Um, a plane crash might be a higher risk. Um, a fire might be even a more higher risk because the probability is much higher and the damage is yeah, also very high. There are some further aspects to be looked at, such as security of the protocols being used. So is the protocol itself inherently insecure? The internal structure and basic configuration of devices, are devices inherently insecure? For instance, is there any, any yeah, back hole? Is there any Trojan host functionality in, included in the device? Um, and a final question, what does the documentation look like? Is documentation available? What source code or was source code purchased? So in some cases, um, yeah, a building automation system might not even be documented. There's something called, or what we call documentation erosion, because uh, let's say over a period of 30 years, which is a typical lifetime for a building, um, over a period of 30 years, the, the documentation erodes. So th there's no, there are some updates to the, to the available hardware or to the installed hardware. And not in every case, the, the documentation is updated. So usually it's very hard to tell yeah, how, the, how the infrastructure you need to protect as an administrator, how it actually looks like. And in some cases, um, the attacker has better knowledge about the installed components, install, about the installed system, and can use this in its own advantage. You probably remember this uh, 
diagram from yesterday. So there's a university campus, for instance. There are many connections between the buildings. And uh, you also remember there's three layers. There's the management layer, the automation layer, and the field layer. Here, we concentrate on the field layer. And you remember all those applications, so I don't go into detail here. We have heating, uh, air conditioning, ventilation, access control, and so on. Um, what we could do is we can, um, yeah, we can collect some attacks. Um, this is usually being done in an attack tree, which is kind of a semi-formal method to yeah, guarantee or at least to improve uh, the chances that you will find most attacks that are imaginable. Um, in this case, you, you start with, with a root node. The root node is attacks on building automation systems. So uh, it could be separated into remote attackers or attackers that are physically present in or near the building. On the left hand side it goes down to manipulation of devices while in use, destroying them, getting access, hiding presence, analyzing devices, finding weaknesses, network analyzer sniffing on internal networks. So uh, I would not say that this um, is a complete analysis of, of uh, possible threats or possible attacks, but at least it helps you to find most of them. On the right hand side, uh, we have manipulation of devices during manufacturing. So maybe the manufacturer introduces voluntarily or uh, involuntarily some uh, uh, backdoors. Um, analyzing devices for weaknesses is something that could be done on the manufacturer side. So if you know uh, the internal structure of the device, then it would be possible to, to find weaknesses much easier. It takes over a global network, for instance, it takes over the internet if the building automation system is being connected via the internet, which it should not be, but in most cases, or in some cases, it is somehow. Maybe there's a hidden gateway or forgotten gateway, or there's a VPN. So even if it's not supposed to be connected to a global network, to the internet, it might be. And in some cases, it is directly connected because the owner doesn't care for security. The owner simply wants to yeah, remote control its network. Um, once again, a forward reference, Johan will tell you something about a controller. And uh, if you use Shodan, for instance, which is a search engine for uh, devices, for IoT devices, uh, you will find a lot of uh, those controllers Johan is investigating openly available in the internet. Uh, further down, there are channeling off of messages, sniffing, inserting messages, denial of service, for instance, intercepting and inserting messages, alternation of messages, men in the middle attacks and replay attacks. So you probably have heard about those. Um, so this attack tree gives, gives us a yeah, kind of a guideline what to look at when we talk about security. Um, yeah, let's have a look about um, our network, uh, all those pictures, all those photographs are taken um, or have been taken mainly by myself within our university building. So I'm not unveiling any secrets here, but um, you see uh, that, yeah, we, we do have some problems as well. So, but this is more or less, um, let's say, yeah, this is true for most buildings. This is exemplary for, for most buildings. We have a lot of network transitions and adapters. So um, on the first page, you see a device that is connected, in this case, with an internal IP address. Uh, this device uh, connects to a field bus, uh, collects a lot of data. And if you look at the description of the device, you will find uh, that it is easily be, that it can easily be configured to access uh, Dropbox. And I really mean Dropbox. Um, the device firmware contains an access protocol to Dropbox um, to upload uh, some, some collected data about, let's say, temperature values and, and data points you, you collect in the building. 
So obviously this is not implemented very securely. Um, the internal IP address is written on it. The second device is a controller or actually no, it's a gateway between uh, IP and an industrial uh, protocol. On the third image you see um, that there's a, I think it's a hub, it's not even a switch, there's a hub uh, used to connect a lot of devices uh, with a local area network where uh, those devices can be remote controlled. And on the right hand side, you already know this picture, I guess it's a controller that uh, yeah, on the field field layer, it connects to a LON or LONWORKS network uh, where there yeah, are some internal devices, some, I think, uh, those fume uh, removal cabinets. Um, I hope this is an English term. So if you are working in a chemistry department, you usually work um, yeah, behind a, how is it called, lamina flow. So um, all, the, all the fume is being removed or the fumes are being removed uh, from those cabinets so that you can still breathe normal air even if you if you burn some critical chemicals um here we we did perform a selection of conceivable attacks and damages so we selected them um or we collected them mechanically uh, mechanical overload of uh, blind motors so for window blinds for for uh, yeah um, shading uh, devices um, there are a lot of motors in it um, or maybe servo motors for ventilation systems can be overloaded by repeated uninterrupted opening and closing for instance so if you have access to a field bus and you would open and close the the window blinds constantly maybe during the night um, they they will fail soon so if they have a let's say projected lifespan of or a life um, cycle uh, expectation of let's say uh, 10,000 uh, up and down movements which is usually enough for 30 years or so uh, if you do this um, 200 times a night then uh, they will die much earlier electrical overload of transformers by simultaneously switching on or off or consumers with an inductive load for instance so if you switch on motors um, uh, this will cause um, yeah, a lot of yeah, not voltage current a lot of current in the in the cables and this could electrical overload the network uh, premature aging of components fluorescent tubes uh, by repeated ignition for instance manipulation of barriers or automated doors so maybe you you close the the barrier if a car is underneath it um, then yeah, if you're sitting in a um, cabriolet then uh, you might you might hit even hit the person otherwise it would cause some some damage some scratches some dents in the car's roof um, yeah, we did an experiment for instance uh, if you manipulate the air conditioning system you can um, create kind of a over pressure or under pressure in certain rooms so uh, it is even hard for a small person to open the door if uh, the air conditioning system is sucking out all the air uh, in that room and the door opens to the outside in this case it's very hard to open or vice versa if the door opens to the inside and you if you increase the air pressure uh, in that room uh, it's very hard to to open the door so it it really can be used you can use the air conditioning to to air yeah, yeah, hold some people within the room uh, another attack the air conditioning system is operated at too high or low temperature this is obviously a problem for servers for people the lighting is permanently switched on and off um, yeah made to blink reputation and damage might be a problem here the ventilation is uh, controlled in such a way that a negative pressure in a room prevents a door from opening or opens the door automatically so the door is being blown out um, this is what we talked about before in sensitive areas for instance um, yeah, those with chemical or biological equipment, a change in ventilation 
exhausting can lead to the release of hazardous substances. You might have heard that some laboratories have uh, under pressure in order to avoid um, yeah, gases to, to leave that area. Um, this is another fancy attack. We, we look into detail on those shards in the third lecture. This tells you something about the duration of stay in the washroom. So, um, as mentioned uh, in last lecture, in the last lecture, there are rooms without a window, and the washing room is exactly uh, in the middle between the corridor and the room where, yeah, where the toilets are. So uh, you can take or you can uh, use the the um, infrared presence detecting sensors to determine the time it takes people to reach the corridor from within the toilet. So if they pass the washing room within, let's say, less than 20 seconds, I personally would not consider this to be proper hand washing. Um, yeah, we, we did this. This is just a little, let's say, teaser for my last lecture. We did this to calculate some score values for employees in our offices. And we were able to tell um, yeah, where the dirty people uh, are, are located that usually pass the washing room. Uh, by the way, I did not tell you uh, whether this is the males or females toilet, but uh, you might be surprised. So welcome to Hackers Paradise. Those pictures, as I said, are all taken in our building. Basic physical access protection is neglected, so uh, there is no no real lock and even if there's a lock the key is um, yeah, placed directly beside it so uh, this is true two-factor authentication here access uh, to the uh, building automation network sorry there's a, an error in translation ga is a german term for gebäude automation which is building automation uh, while existing or brought along interfaces um, so um, there are a lot of interfaces behind those doors. Uh, in this case, there's a KNX2 USB adapter available, which we can use to access the USB, uh, sorry, to access the KNX network via USB. And then we can do everything a device could do by itself. So this is the second factor here once again. Um, the same here, uh, this is one of those uh, free Hume removal cabinets um, and um, you see there are two, two little holes in, in that device and um, yeah, those two holes are connectors to the field bus behind it. Uh, there's a Lonworks adapter which can be connected to those to those holes here and then you can play around with the with the cabinet or with the fume removal uh, cabinet and you can increase the pressure or change the direction of airflow and not even for this for this one particular shelf here uh, you can do that for a lot of uh, them because they are all interconnected with each other so this makes the typical danger quite obvious Messages almost everywhere, unencrypted and without authentication. This is what I said already. So access to media, at least in the field level, is possible. Also hidden access. You could place a an LTE modem or something um, in a in a ceiling or in a wall, uh, or even behind one of those light switches to um, transfer all the KNX data to the internet worldwide to your desired point. Uh, in this case, um, yeah, we were wiretapping the, the KNX bus behind this controller for, for window blinds. Messages almost everywhere, unencrypted and without authentication. So if you look at the uh, network, there are so many broadcasts, you can read everything on that layer as well. Um, even real physical access is dispensable. So uh, what we did here is we put a little coil in front of the wall, uh, used a mixer as actually a, an amplifier 
and uh, recorded the audio signal. Remember, we are at 9600 bits per second. So this is very well uh, in the audible range. So if you, um, yeah, if you if you convert this into a digital signal with um, a yeah, sampling frequency of let's say 96,000 uh, samples per second, um, then you still have 10 samples per bit. And this is uh, yeah fairly enough to yeah to read the signal. So what you see here is a KNX telegram in a wave file, and uh, yeah, it takes half a page of code to decode this and uh, to know what's going on on the bus, even without touching the cable, just listening to KNX radio. This is how it looks like. So as I said, it starts with three zeros usually. Um, information on the configuration can be obtained with almost unlimited ease. Um, yeah, a neat electrician puts it on the device and sometimes they are maintained and uh, while they are being maintained, uh, it's a good idea to have your smartphone ready to take some pictures. This is what I did here. I did not open it personally, so it was open when I took the picture. Uh, trust me. Information on the configuration can be obtained with almost unlimited ease. As I said before, uh, this is a globally unique IP4 address being uh, placed in front of the device. Fortunately, they have changed it in the meanwhile, but uh, initially it was accessible via the internet. Um, there was just a firewall, uh, but yeah, if there's a mail configuration in the firewall, it would be accessible directly to the internet. Uh, 139.30 is the IP address range of the University of Rostock. Um, a lot of gateways everywhere. Um, more gateways, open access to user interfaces. So if you look at the LAN being used to interconnect those gateways or those devices, those controller devices, and if you perform an NMAP, you will find a lot of um, even Telnet and uh, TFTP, HTTP services, um, which you can use to yeah, get a fancy remote control to a DDC direct digital controller. As I said, those are the controllers, the PLCs or the PLC equivalents uh, in a building automation system. And here it says some pumps or some heating uh, to translate the German here. Um, there are other interfaces available and um, in most cases they not they are not even protected with a password or they they still have the default password and or in most cases yeah you can directly access the system and you cannot only read you can also write so uh, pressing on one of the green buttons will switch on something or switch off something that might be important for certain areas of the building there's a lot of software available um, so you don't have to start uh, from scratch, you can use a lot of software, a lot of uh, libraries um, to access those yeah, field buses. This this makes hacking even easier. So no need to program yourself. Actually putting everything together is sufficient. Um, problems with VPNs, we talked about that before. No further restricted remote access via VPN for many suppliers. Um, yeah, this is the, the building automation system or the control uh, interface to to yeah, every every university building in Rostock actually. Um, I'm not sure whether this is working. So the uh, NSA, for instance, is telling us they are uh, gathering information about uh, building automation systems. Um, I'm not sure whether this is working. So let's give it a try. So why are we successful? We put the time in to know that network. We put the time in to know it better than the people who designed it and the people who are securing it. And that's the bottom line. And you'll kind of hear that woven throughout the talk. So I, I see a growing trend that are really making it hard and diffusing the network boundary. Um, trust boundaries now extended to partners. Um, personal devices, right? All of us love to have our iPhones, Androids, tablets, devices come and go. Right? You're trusting those 
onto the network. Um, there's even the heating and cooling systems, right? Other elements of building infrastructure and more. So what are you doing to really shore up the trust boundary around the things you absolutely must defend? And that, for me, is what it comes down to. Do you really know what the keys to the kingdom are that you must defend? Right? Instrument, defend, pay attention to those crown jewels um, because that attention and rigor really makes our job hard. And, uh, yeah, this is about or giving an insight what uh, the, the government is doing with building automation systems. Yeah, how about the, the protocols being used for the two most frequently used protocols uh, at the field level, uh, namely Canix and LON, results are devastating and standard configuration. As I said, there are optional security means, uh, the encryption and authentication is optional, but in all uh, installations we investigated, there, they, this is not switched on. And even um, if you have a few devices that are able to use encryption and authentication, uh, there will be a lot of legacy devices. So the lifetime of a building is 30 years or more. And the, the main problem here is updatability. You can't even update a light switch. So you have to stay with the protocol uh, that has been installed during the building phase of the building. Um, yeah, in IP-based networks, um, there, there is a lot of progress in terms of security. But uh, those ideas did not find a way to building automation system to field buses. So um, if you imagine that um, yeah, the next step beyond building automation is uh, either Internet of Things or um, some, let's say, metropolitan area networks because you, you want to build a smart city and interconnect all the buildings or so. Um, if, you, if you look at a scenario like this, uh, yeah, I would rather uh, store some, some food and, and uh, water for, let's say, two weeks. And I don't mean uh, I'm one of those prepper guys uh, who who prepare for the third world war. I, I just mean um, as a precaution because we rely on those systems very much. Um, it would be yeah, it would be a good idea to, to have food and water for two weeks. Um, yeah, after gaining physical access by installing an adapter plug behind the ceiling paneling, um, attackers can trigger any action on the field level. In general, some, not all, of the excellent accesses to programs, devices, and device functions were secured with usernames and passwords. Uh, and nothing else. So there's no second factor authentication and um, there might be a default password or there might be a password which has been passed on to a lot of people. Uh, yeah, this is obviously a security problem. In IP-based network areas, so VLANs, physical access is protected by locking the corresponding rooms. So the large number of rooms themselves with many authorized persons and the large number of possible network accesses and possibilities for misconfiguration make this appear questionable as a valid protection. So closing the door is not a protection, um, especially on the field bus layer, because the field bus is spreading within the entire building. You can even access it in your own office um, or you can access it as a student while sitting in a lecture hall also. Um, yeah, there's a very high risk of considerable damage, attacks with the aim of causing chaos and attraction attention or and attracting attention are particularly easy to carry out in the buildings we have examined. Um, yeah, we can control arbitrary actuators um, or we can simply record sensor data and uh, yeah, do a lot of fancy stuff with that. Uh, we will have a look into this later on in several other lectures. Uh, in my lecture, we will have a look uh, at what we know about people by simply yeah, collecting KNX log files. The adoption of many concepts from the traditional network world is possible and reasonable, but has not been done. 
documentation and continuation of documentation must be improved to avoid document erosion. Intensification of the cooperation between building technicians and network technicians is necessary. Uh, usually they don't talk to each other. Um, yeah, if, for instance, the building uh, technicians require a VLAN, uh, the other guys will throw them a cable, um, yeah, will install an outlet and that's it. So after that, there's no, no further communication. Um, and we did not even talk about trust boundaries here. So everything currently is under control of, of the organization running the building. If you look at, um, let's say, um, machine learning services. So um, for instance, some companies are offering um, a service in exchange of a lot of data. So you give them your KNX data and they will tell you how to optimize the heating of your building. And in this case, you have a lot of trust boundaries. You have a lot of uh, yeah, involved parties, involved entities in this. And uh, between them, yeah, you can have a contract which should guarantee security. But uh, let's say in an IoT environment where you have IoT devices, sensors, actuators, you have uh, network providers, you have uh, service providers, you have cloud providers, you have um, edge device or FOC device services. Um, there, there are so many involved entities that security is, is an illusion. It will not be secure. You can quote me on that. IoT will never be secure. Um, the summary of this part is whoever wants to protect his network must know this structure, its devices, its interfaces. So a security analysis is necessary. Most solutions for security processes are obvious and easy to implement, um, sorry, uh, but ex expensive and elaborate. Experience is available, but awareness must grow. In the second section, we have a look at LoRaWAN which is a, yeah, an interesting IoT protocol um, because it, yeah, it's, it's not installed locally in your own building, in your own flat. It's, it's provided yeah, in a metropolitan context. So the range is very high and you can use LoRaWAN um, networks that are being provided by a community, for instance. So that's why we have a look on, on LoRaWAN because um, of the high range and uh, yeah, specifics this, this, yeah, that, that follows out of this. Um, if we look at protocols, we, we should have a look on the uh, different ISO OSI layers, layer one, the physical layer, for instance. Um, we look at the media, the frequencies, data rate, modulation, coding, transmission power. Um, by the way, I'm developing code. Uh, seems to my, my nose seems to be closing. Um, sorry for that. Um, layer two, the data link layer, um, topology, media access, error correction, addressing, duty cycles, acknowledgements are uh, yeah facts we we can or are terms we can use to describe the protocol. Uh, on the network layer, uh, we have routing, we have topologies, um, we have addressing again, layer four to seven types and structure of messages. And uh, in general, if you look at uh, security, we have a look at encryption, authentication, and how the uh, yeah, network is being deployed or whether it's locally deployed and what the range is, for instance. Um, the challenge is, uh, yeah, in recent activities, we as a working group were looking for a way to connect small mobile IoT devices with a server. IoT devices are connected wirelessly to the internet in almost all cases due to the low energy resources, specialized protocols are utilized. Uh, one such protocol is LoRaWAN, which stands for Long Range Wide Area Network. It was developed with the aim of sending small amounts of data to the internet as energy efficient and robust as possible. The underlying uh, layer one, remember layer one uh, modulation and so on, 
the underlying layer one protocol named LoRa, long range, defines uh, diff different frequencies. For Europe, for instance, it's 868 megahertz. Uh, in the Americas, it's 915 megahertz, um, which is the standard frequency and 433 megahertz are also possible worldwide. These frequencies allow concrete walls to be penetrated. So um, it's sub gigahertz. Uh, it it can still can still penetrate some some concrete walls. So it can be used indoors and outdoors. The transmission ranges or the transmission range is up to 10 kilometers in rural areas or without penetrating walls and typically two to five kilometers in rural areas, including indoor scenarios. So if you look at our application for IT devices, for instance, um, yeah, we want to transfer the blood glucose level, um, which will be read out via NFC and regularly transmitted to a central server, um, then it's obvious that we need confidentiality of those, those data. Transmission security was important for us because one of the applications and uh, yeah, we needed to check LoRaWAN for whether it meets our requirements or not in terms of security. And we used this opportunity to have a look on the general security concepts in LoRaWAN, which is something I would like to explain. Um, LoRaWAN, for instance, uh, the Things Network, which is a community driven network, is spread almost everywhere in Europe, in the United States, obviously, as well. And um, yeah, the, the basic concept is, as a user, you can place a gateway connected to the internet, and that's it. Um, and the Things Network, the community network behind that, provides um, yeah, the infrastructure to deliver LoRa messages via the gateway, which is placed in, in some locations. Uh, to an application server you might either run yourself or um, yeah, for some basic purposes you can you can still run it on the things networks infrastructure so collecting data for instance um, in a time series database um, is something they provide for free to everyone um, I think yeah we should have a look here on an installation itself so how does it look in reality? And um, yeah, there's a little insert into this lecture. We did climb up uh, one of the high-rise buildings of Rostock. There are not too many of them, just a few of them. Yeah, this gives us an opportunity to show you uh, the city, um, maybe a sunset behind me. Um, this is a 12 or 13 story building. And uh, the reason why we did climb up is uh, that we um, the reason is that we have a lot of antennas up here uh, because of the uh, yeah, very uh, good position uh, in terms of uh, coverage area. Um, I'm a member of a society which is called Open Net Initiative in Rostock and uh, yeah, we have an agreement with the landlord uh, of this building and uh, we are allowed to place some antennas. One of the antennas uh, and specifically the one I would like to talk about is um, a LoRaWAN antenna. So we have a redial antenna up there um, and uh, this antenna covers an area yeah, in open space, an open area uh, of let's say or a distance of let's say 10 kilometers. We can do a test later on uh, with let's say three or four of those um, locations we can cover the entire city which has 200,000 inhabitants so uh, with very limited efforts uh, it would be possible to, to provide LoRaWAN servers uh, IoT service to an entire city and uh, yeah if you want to I would like to encourage you to build your own gateway um, in the package we have sent to you there should be a LoRaWAN uh, device um, an end device which you can use to test your gateway this is what we are going to do now okay welcome back wireless LoRaWAN end devices communicate via radio with gateways you have seen such a gateway or at least the antenna which format the data packets unchanged to a network server, which is connected to the internet. The network server forwards packets to the application server. Um, so the end device is sending it 
to the network server. Uh, different users of the network can place their own application servers for their respective purposes. So the application server is on top and this is, uh, yep. oh, where is it? Okay, this direction, that, that's the application server and the sole purpose uh, of the join server, which is here on the right hand side. Uh, sorry for the, for the animation. The sole purpose of the join server is to issue unique nonces used in the process of an end device joining the network. Um, yeah, this is the, the reason uh, why we have a join server is uh, that we um, want to avoid replay attacks. So a nonce is a number that is unique over the lifetime of a system. This leads directly to security. So uh, let's start with some security considerations. As mentioned before, a range of 10 kilometers is typical in rooftop scenarios without penetrating walls. So yeah, it doesn't look much, but if we put this into, let's say central London, uh, yeah, we can use this to estimate the risk. In order to roughly estimate the risk and to present a more dramatic threatening scenario, we calculate the number of possible attackers. Um, yeah, if we take the population density of London, of central London into account, there are slightly more than half a million people being able to receive both stations if they are at a maximum distance of 10 kilometers apart from each other. Please note that the numbers go up if the attacker needs to receive one station only. Um, if the end device and the radio gateway are very close to each other, there are more than 1.2 million people living in that area covered by both stations. So one point, sorry, 1.8 million people, I said 1.2, 1.8 million people uh, in central London within a range of 10 kilometers. Um, this means here, if you consider, let's say, one out of thousand people to be evil and um, yeah even if there are one out of a uh, thousand of those people being able to do so uh, this is still 1.8 people so the probability is, is quite high that the evil person which is capable of uh, intercepting LoRaWAN messages and interfering with the network um, will be within range. This yeah, dramatically increases the risk. If there are so many possibilities, uh, actually, um, yeah, if you place a receiver, you can receive a lot of lower one messages already now. And if you know what's going on there, and if you can um, even play a man in the middle for that scenario, um, you might be able to, to yeah, destroy an application or at least to, yeah, to cause some damage. Uh, yeah, in in LoRaWAN standard 1.1, all devices are customized via two shared keys. Um, the network key, NWK key, is used to derive keys, which are then being used for encrypting the traffic between end devices and network servers and to guarantee authenticity of several messages. So to, to sign messages, uh, this is here, here it is called uh, MIC, which means um, message integrity code. Well, sometimes it's also called message authentication code. Um, the app key itself, on the other hand, is used to derive another session key called app S key. The session key is being used to encrypt data up and downloads and provides end-to-end -end encryption between end device and application server. So if you provide your device, if you yeah, deliver your device with an app key, uh, then you can guarantee to a certain extent, um, I will come to that later, uh, you can guarantee an end-to-end -end encryption between application and mobile device. In all cases, LoRaWAN uses AES128 in different modes. 
the security of AES and modes are out of scope here. So we assume this to be secure. Um, currently there's no known attack on AES. Um, yeah. Let's have a look on the working modes. The simplest of the encryption modes uh, is the electronic codebook ECB mode. Um, the message, the plain text, is divided into blocks and each block is encrypted separately. Identical messages or message blocks are also encrypted in the same way. This means um, if you put in the same plain text, you will get the same ciphertext all the time. An exchange of blocks in the ciphertext leads uh, to the same exchange of blocks in the decrypted message. An error in a block only affects the decryption of this block. So um, the following blocks yeah, will remain intact if there's a transmission error. The use of ECB mode is therefore not recommended unless a single message block is to be encrypted only once. Um, if you have certain information about um, the messages, um, if you know certain parts of it, you can guess some keys because uh, it's symmetric encryption. And um, yeah, if you have a known plain text attack or partly known plain text attack, um, then you can decrypt some parts of the key. Um, Cypher blockchain is another is another working mode. If CBC is used for integrity protection, the initialization vector is set to zero, and the last block encrypted with CBC is appended as a MAC. Um, the so-called CBC MAC or CBC residual value to the original unencrypted message and sent together with this MAC. And um, yeah, this forms a chain of uh, encryption. And um, yeah, this guarantees uh, that the same plain text will be encrypted differently if the encryption happens um, in a different step of, yeah, of the working process. Um, count, counting modes, almost the same here. Instead of um, this, yeah, let's say, how's it called? Yeah, in, instead of using um, the last encryption process for the next encryption process, a counter is being used here. Um, loopback was the word I was looking for. Um, so instead of a of this 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 loop, we we are using a counter which is incremented every time a message is being sent, and uh, this also uh, yeah forces a different encryption whenever the plain text the same plain text is being encrypted. <clears throat> yeah, data frames. Um, are encrypted end-to-end -end between end devices and application server. For this purpose, the app session key is being used. The session key is generated during the joint procedure um, when over-the-air activation is, is used. So um, over-the-air activation means um, the device comes with no session keys being configured um, and uh, the, the keys will be exchanged in a Diffie Hellman like uh, style and uh, yeah this this key is being generated and this can be uh, repeated so this would guarantee kind of a perfect forward secrecy which means um, yeah even if an attacker is able to um, analyze a key it would only give him the the possibility would only allow him to see certain messages, not all of them back in history. Because if you are changing the key frequently with this perfect forward secrecy, um, then uh, you, you limit the effect a stolen key or an analyzed key would have. Um, in case a pre-shared network, or sorry, a pre-shared session key is being used, uh, which is called in LoRaWAN, uh, activation by personalization, uh, the same session key will be used forever for the entire lifespan of, of the device. This is fine if the device um, 
yeah, rarely sends messages, for instance, maybe only once. Uh, let's say you put such a device in your in your boat uh, to detect some water in the in the in inside the boat. Um, yeah, this usually happens only once, and uh, for this case, uh, there's no need to to change the key regularly, frequently. Uh, for this application, it's just enough to have it encrypted and authenticated once, and the, after that, uh, the boat is sinking anyway, so you have to replace the device. Um, every end device is initialized with a join EUI, a device EUI, and a device nonce during configuration. The join process or the join request contains those data. Its integrity is protected with network key. Join requests are not encrypted. Hence, uh, those data are not considered to be confidential. The join accept message contains the following information. A join nonce, which is a device-specific counter value, which never repeats itself for a specific end device. So the join server never resets. Um, and uh, some keys are being derived from this uh, or with the help of this uh, nonce, for instance, um, yeah, some, some session keys for the network and for the application as well. The join nonce is increased with every join accept message. Uh, there's also a network ID, which corresponds to the net ID of the device's home network. Um, in case of LoRaWAN of the Things network, of this implementation of LoRaWAN, uh, the network key is known to everybody. So uh, this does not really provide security, um, but um, yeah, for, for outsiders it does. Device addresses uh, consist of 32 bits and uh, yeah, with the help of the received information, the end device is able to calculate all needed session keys. And this join uh, can be repeated, then it's called a rejoin. A device can periodically send a rejoin request and um, as a consequence thereof, all the session keys will be reinitiated. Typical attacks. Yeah, an obvious possibility is to spy out secret key material, which is stored in end devices. Network key and application key are generated and stored in each device during manufacturing or during let's say provisioning, hence there's a high risk of copying those keys from the device. This is not a problem of the protocol itself and is hence out of scope of this yeah, uh, analysis here. Um, if the session key, yeah, what can you do by the way? Uh, yeah, you, can, you can store those keys in a hardware security module, yeah, something like this, um, which makes it harder for the attacker to to access those keys because they are stored inside, they never get out, they are not stored in uh, volatile memory, they don't need to be um, yeah, flashed into the device, uh, but uh, yeah, they still can be analyzed by using electron microscope, for instance, and having a look into the memory cells of those devices. But it's much, much harder uh, and needs a lot of effort for the attacker and hence uh, it decreases the security risk because the probability is much lower. Um, yeah, if the session keys were generated within the over the air activation, the session keys are derived from, from those keys and a series of counters and nonces. So it is important for the cryptographic methods um, that counter and initialization vectors are not repeated. Remember uh, the, the AES working modes and um, yeah, they are initialization vectors and they should never repeat, otherwise uh, they will generate the same keys. Um, the join server guarantees that the join nonce is not repeated and the end device guarantees that the device nonce or the rejoin counter uh, is not repeated. Potential attackers can send any number of messages, so if they manage to get an overflow of this counter. Maybe it's a 32-bit number. If they send 4 billion messages, um, the, the counter will repeat. But this is, uh, yeah, in, in reality, it would not happen too frequently because the, the low bandwidth. Um, 
but also uh, devices are actually required to to stop working uh, after the counter is being yeah, full. Uh, in this case, you have to throw away the hardware and buy a new device. Um, I'm not sure whether this is realized in reality, but 4 billion messages is quite a lot of messages. Okay, yeah, it's in the nature of LoRaWAN that end devices send data at least occasionally. Um, the location of those devices can be determined during transmission. So an attacker can use receivers with known locations and yeah, an attacker will also get um, yeah, information about the received signal strengths. Um, maybe three gateways are within range of a mobile device, which is depicted here. Uh, you will get a an RSI, RSSI value from each of those uh, gateways, which means that uh, you can estimate the location of the mobile device and everyone uh, who has access to that data can do. Um, yeah. In installations with a lot of radio gateways, this works very well and this delivers a yeah, rather precise location information for the mobile device. Um, replay of frames yeah, should be yeah, denied. We have nonces. Profiling is uh, yeah, finding out something about the location. Let's have a look at Z-Wave at, uh, as, as the last protocol we have a look at. Um, Z-Wave is being used in a lot of home automation networks. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of devices available. Uh, valves for heaters are those um, yeah, plugs you put in between the, the, the power outlet and the device and can remote control this. A lot of switches and even um, yeah, motors for doors. You, you can place this in, in your flat uh, at, at the outer door uh, to get access via, via the network, to get physical access via the network. Um, this is such a module. Uh, it also works on 868 MHz. Um, this is the desired frequency for, for a lot of those building automation systems, IoT systems. Um, it consists of a 8051 microprocessor or microcontroller actually. Uh, if you look at the description, it's an 8-bit microcontroller, a very slow one, uh, with just 32 megahertz external clock frequency, but for most applications this will do. So you don't need another microcontroller. You can you can put all the functionality in the uh, in the module itself. You don't need external hardware. Uh, then it has general purpose input outputs. Yeah, you can put a relay on that, uh, or you can put a sensor on that, and uh, yeah, you can build your own Z-Wave device with the help of such a module, uh, which is available for a lot of manufacturers. Um, the physical layer, yeah, briefly have a look at it. Nine thousand six hundred bits per second as well. Uh, frequency shift keying, Manchester coding. Uh, there's a higher data rate specified on the different frequency. Yeah, we don't need to look into detail here. Uh, the Mac layer um, provides a frame, which is then uh, encoded in, in Manchester code. Uh, there's a preamble added uh, at the beginning. Then we have frequency shift uh, keying modulation. The base frequency is yeah, added and uh, then we put everything or we, we forward everything to the amplifier and send it to the air. This is how, how the device looks like internally. Yeah, if you look at data frames, um, there's a physical layer frame. Um, it consists of Mac data, uh, which is in this case a single cast Mac frame, which consists a home ID and a source ID, which indicates or which identifies your installation a frame control, length, field, and uh, the payload. And the payload itself consists of header command classes, which might be a switch on the light or a dim the light to parameter 15. Uh, in this case, the command class will be lighting or so, and the command will be uh, 
dim value or yeah set dim value and the parameter might be 15 or 15 percent or something so um, we don't go too much into detail here just remember or just just keep in mind that yeah we, we have a lot of uh, layers here we have currently you see no encryption so encryption is present we will have a look at this later on each telegram is confirmed um, so there's an acknowledgement message Z wave sender tries to send a message up to three times um, this might be important for availability so if you talk about availability as a key concern of security yeah, this this acknowledgement or this repetition of message of messages um, is is a factor on on availability after three unsuccessful attempts an error message is generated um, yeah maybe the device is flashing or a light is going on or something and the number of unsuccessful attempts is used as an indicator for the link quality at uh, Z-Wave provides routing mechanisms so you can have devices that forward Z-Wave messages to other devices so you can increase the the span or the the, the range of, of the network um, the Mac layer yeah a network has at least one controller and at least one slave primary controllers can add other nodes which is called inclusion um, so it might look like this there's a static controller in the lower left there might be a portable controller maybe a remote control which is also a control and uh, some slaves maybe one of those light switches or uh, sorry or relays that control the light or those uh, plugs uh, you put between the power outlet and the device itself some battery powered devices are also uh, present here or at least one uh, this device does not take part in a routing algorithm or does not take part in a routing process as it wants to conserve its energy as much as possible um, there's a home id as an identifier the home id is defined by the manufacturer nodes receive a node id controller typically has the node id 01 slave nodes receive their node id from the controller during the inclusion process um, yeah inclusion works like follows the controller is switched to inclusion mode so software command is being used uh, user action must take place on the slave typically a key must be pressed in, in uh, most devices we have seen require a button to be pressed three times so this guarantees uh, that the user at least has physical access to the device and a remote attack uh, is is not very feasible the node id is assigned by the controller keys are exchanged optionally this is optionally and uh, with old versions the slave and controller had to communicate directly with each other newer versions of the standard also define inclusion via intermediate nodes so via nodes that are not in the vicinity of of the controller uh, earlier it was assumed that you could either move the controller to the device that needs to be included or to bring the device that needs to be included to the controller so that they are in direct range of each other um, let's have a look at the at the bootstrapping process here of the uh, at the inclusion process uh, the network inclusion happens between uh, the node on the right hand side and uh, a controller um, here the secure level is being entered and as you see this is an alternative so either the s2 which is the secure version is being entered or a s0 um is entered where no keys are being exchanged this depends on the capabilities of devices so a more or less stupid device uh, won't be able to exchange keys here um, this this could cause a security problem for instance if if in the process of of inclusion you are able to let's say destroy certain messages um, you stop them from being receivable at the joining node um, the joining node will fall back to the unencrypted mode 
and this causes a security problem. Um, here, once again, security message um, AES is being used in OFB mode, um, CBC is being used to guarantee authentication. Um, there is a 128 bit random network key and a cipher and MEC. Uh, so, MEC is uh, media, uh, sorry, uh, message authentication code, so the authentication. Um, they are being derived from the from the network key, and me me message, <coughs> sorry, message fres freshness is being guaranteed with a sixty four bit nonce, which means um, you have two to the power of sixty four messages uh, until it it rolls over. OFB is the output feedback mode. Uh, it looks pretty much like uh, the CBC mode. Um, so uh, the result of a, a block cipher encryption is being used in the next step, and this guarantees different plain text is, or the sorry this guarantees the same plain text to be encrypted differently uh, depending on the step the plain text appears in the encryption process. Key exchange um, looks like this: uh, the controller. Uh, tells the secure device yeah, to get ready for key establishment. Um, yeah, then they request a nonce. A nonce value is being sent to the controller. Um, the network key is being um, encrypted um, and um, sent to the secure device. And then uh, the same happens in the other uh, direction. So. Um, yeah, at the end of this process, uh, both controller and secure device have shared a key. Um, the key might be encrypted in an old version. It uh, could also be delivered unencrypted. So in case someone is by chance uh, being able to, yeah, to witness this very rare event of an inclusion of n inclusion process, um, he would be able uh, to, yeah, to read the network key and keep it for him. Um, yeah, what else? The, the K0 or K KO uh, key is um, yeah, unique uh, for, no, it's the same for, for all um, Z-Wave devices. Um, the key is transmitted unencrypted during inclusion. Uh, if uh, S2 is being used, the key generation happens via Diffie-Hellman. And um, yeah, an, an attacker might be able to force S0 mode and hence uh, might be able to uh, read the unencrypted session key, uh, sorry, the unencrypted network key during the inclusion process. Oh. Let's have a look at the devices. Um, forensics pays off at the controller or downstream databases. So if you want to know what's going on in the network, uh, hack the controller. For security or a few security holes uh, that do not require physical access uh, have been found. Uh, they all only work during inclusion by yeah, manipulating messages, by, by sending out a little interference signal. And uh, yeah, keys can be found in the devices. So um, if you, you steal a device, you might be able to read out the, the crypto material. Yeah, that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. Those are my contact details and uh, I will be available for a discussion in a few seconds. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.